one thing that I, really strikes me in listening to Dr. Kleinman's talk is how hard it is to communicate science to patients, whether it's that antibiotics don't work on a common virus or we have challenges with communicating vaccine science. Uh, GMOs fall right in that category and it's a huge challenge for us in communicating science. I really didn't want to follow one of the great communicators of our time and such an erudite physician as Dr. Kleinman, but uh, I have this slot and I hope I can live up to the Mass General um, reputation. I have uh, no disclosures financially. I'm in private practice with GI Care for Kids. I did found a camp for kids with celiac disease. If you can plug that for your patients, we usually have 60 to 70 kids a year. It's called Camp We Can Eat It. Um, we also do take gluten sensitive kids. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't pay me any salary. And I do have a grant. I'm going to talk a little bit about fecal transplants. Again, that pays me no salary. And my last disclosure is that ICD 10 is really annoying me lately. And, um, so, chapter one of this three part talk, if I can get through it, is about gluten. I was requested by the Nutrition Committee to talk a little bit about gluten. And there are three ways that gluten can hurt us. Uh, gluten, uh, one to two percent of the population with celiac disease, a real gluten allergy, IgE mediated allergy, and then this new, relatively new topic over the last 10 years um, called non celiac gluten sensitivity. But a new name has sprung up from Dr. Guandolini in, in uh, Chicago, and I think it's a very appropriate term called wheat intolerance syndrome. Celiac disease, this is probably the main practical part of this talk for you. The rest uh, you hopefully will find interesting, but the practical part is that celiac disease is a genetically predetermined, well not predetermined, genetically associated autoimmune enteropathy, and it occurs in one to two percent of the general population. We have symptoms from our head to our toe with celiac disease. I have diagnosed kids with just headaches with celiac disease. Um, legitimately, their blood tests and their biopsies are positive and their headaches improve on a gluten-free diet. Uh, kids with celiac disease have more enamel defects. They also get aptostomatitis more often. The classic symptoms, abdominal pain, diarrhea, but many kids with celiac actually have chronic constipation. We see uh, growth failure classically with celiac, but a lot of kids now diagnosed with, growth, with uh, celiac disease are growing normally and some are actually obese. Hashimoto's thyroiditis, uh, dermatitis herpetiforms, which is a really incredibly itchy rash. It does not occur very often in children, usually bilateral extensor surfaces. Um, it, it would be rare for you to see that. It's it's fascinating rash. Um, it's so itchy, people have committed suicide over the itchiness. And there's a medication called Dapsone that one or two doses relieves the itchiness. Nobody really knows why, but dermatitis herpetiforms is associated as a as is celiac disease. But also patients with other autoimmune conditions can have celiac disease like psoriasis and vitiligo. How do you test for celiac disease? If you're over the age of three, the best test is the anti-tissue transglutaminase antibody. That is also called the TTG. It comes in two flavors, an IgA-based test and an IgG-based test. You want to order the anti-TTG IgA-based test. We also get a quantitative serum IgA, and that's not to look for abnormalities necessarily in an IgA. IgA deficiency occurs in about 5% of kids with celiac disease. Um, so it, uh, if you don't make any IgA, your IgA-based testing is inaccurate. So don't tell a patient that they have celiac disease if they have a low IgA or high IgA. You need to confirm it with other testing. It's like kind of standing on the bridge over the highway, and I say, I'm going to find all the red Mercedes. But if nobody's driving Mercedes, you're never going to find a red Mercedes. So if nobody's making IgA, you're not going to find the TTG IgA. HLA typing, that's human leukocyte antigen. Those are um, uh, proteins expressed on the surface of white blood cells that bind antigens. For celiac disease, you have to have either DQ2 or DQ8, and that's a very strong genetic link. 99 to 100% of people with celiac disease have these HLA markers, DQ2 and DQ8, and those are commercially available. Um, but 30% of us have DQ2 or DQ8. The big question is why do only 1% of us have celiac disease? And, and about 130 other genes have been identified that uh, are associated with celiac disease. Here's what the endoscopy looks like. 
let's see, we have some cobblestoning here. Um, you can see some scalloping. Here you have the normal villi. It kind of looks ve velvety. These are all normal, healthy villi um, that help us absorb our nutrients. And, and these villi have been flattened. The scallops, the areas where the villi are absent, uh, these regions have unhealthy villi due to the inflammation in the autoimmune uh, condition. OK, so who do you test with celiac disease? This is my opinion. This is not necessarily a, a national consensus. But I do think that people, kids who have chronic GI symptoms merit, once you're starting to do blood tests, uh, merit a TTG and an IgA. The challenge is who do you test that doesn't have GI symptoms? And I think if they have a microcytic anemia that's not very well explained, that's a good population to look at. If you have growth concerns, first degree relatives with celiac disease, Kids with Down syndrome and Williams syndrome have an increased risk of celiac disease, uh, thyroiditis patients, and type 2 diabetics. Uh, have any of you had patients participate in the TEDDY study? We've been lucky in Georgia that um, uh, we're one of the sites for a uh, national, international prospective study looking at HLA markers for diabetes, and many of those markers are shared uh, with celiac disease, so we've been able to look prospectively at uh, kids who develop celiac disease starting in infancy. And there's some very interesting conclusions made from that. One is the antigliadins often appear prior to the TTG antibody, even up to a year sooner. So that's why I say under the age of three include the antigliadin antibodies. The second way that gluten can hurt us is through a classic wheat allergy. We're familiar with peanut allergy, anaphylaxis hives. Wheat allergy, very similar. You can measure it with IgE-based allergy testing. Um, that's either immunocap testing now. We used to use RASH, but now we use an easier technique based on ELISA called immunocap. And uh, you can measure it with skin testing. Um, these are typical symptoms of allergy, hives, uh, abdominal pain, diarrhea, vomiting that should occur soon after. A lot of parents will come to you and say, well, I gave him a wheat cracker, and three days later, he had a stomach ache. And it must have been that wheat cracker. And, and that's not quite the way food allergy is supposed to work. It should be a much uh, closer causality. Um, keep in mind, this is, this is important. Um, it is very common to have false positive skin tests for a variety of foods. So just because your skin test is positive for a food doesn't mean you're allergic to it. You can have a skin test positive to peanuts, and you eat peanut butter and jelly sandwich every day in the doctor's lounge because you can't stand the other food that's there, and you don't have a reaction, but your skin test positive doesn't mean that you're allergic to it. It's really whether you have the reaction or not. Another misnomer is the IgG-based testing. Does anybody ever order IgG-based testing? Not that you would admit it after you see the slide there. <laughs> IgG-based testing means that you've been exposed to that food. It does not mean that you're allergic to it. It is one of the... Um, pseudoscience tests that sometimes you, you will see come across. Parents can obtain that test on their own or through um, naturopaths or homeopaths. So IgG-based testing, this is straight from Hugh Sampson, one of the leading international authorities at Mount Sinai on food allergy at our last meeting in Washington. There's no uh, worth to IgG-based food testing. And, uh, the last, uh, the last part of chapter one, uh, how gluten can hurt us, is uh, most controversial. And it is this non-celiac gluten sensitivity or wheat intolerance syndrome. This is what's driving the gluten-free craze in America. Uh, people seem to feel better when they don't eat gluten. And that's really the only definition, that, you don't, that, that if you don't consume gluten, you feel better. That, there's not a biomarker. There is not an HLA type that is more sensitive to, cel to gluten and is not celiac disease. There are not inflammatory markers in the blood or on biopsy. People who have non-celiac gluten sensitivity, we have not yet found a biomarker. I, Dr. Fasano works with Dr. Kleiman. Has Dr. Fasano found a biomarker yet? So he, Dr. Kleiman recruited uh, the new chief of GI at Mass General, Dr. Alessio Fasano, brilliant man. and, uh, and uh, a seminal author in, in introducing us to the fact that Americans do have celiac disease. And he actually is an advocate that there is an entity called non-celiac gluten sensitivity or wheat intolerance syndrome. I'll tell you that it's controversial. You can find studies that support it. 
and you can find studies that refute it. It does appear that there is a subset of patients that say that they're gluten sensitive that can pass a double blind trial so that they will get symptoms when they're introduced to gluten without knowing it and their symptoms go away when their gluten is withdrawn. But it doesn't appear to be nearly as large a percentage as people uh, believe for themselves. There's nothing essential in gluten um, that we have to have. I don't object to people being gluten free. But the main message I want to pass on to you is please test the patients. If they're talking about going gluten free, it's probably nice to know if they have a lifelong autoimmune disease uh, before they go embark on a gluten free diet. It's going to be more than a couple of weeks. So this is my segue into chapter two, celiac disease and the microbiome. Uh, I've been really interested in the microbiome. I, Probably you guys can't go to a single meeting and not hear a lot about the microbiome, and I'm a little bit at risk for telling you things that you may already know. Um, early studies are showing that the gut microbiota uh, are related to celiac disease, that there is a dysbiosis, an imbalance of bacteria in celiac disease. Uh, recent studies have shown that kids who've been treated with a lot of antibiotics in their early years, maybe at more risk for having celiac disease. So there seems to be some connection between the gut bacteria and the development of celiac disease that we're still trying to work through. Um, so let's learn a little bit about the microbiome. Uh, microbiome is uh, um, everywhere now, whether you go to an endocrine meeting, a GI or neurology meeting, um, everybody's talking about the microbiome. And it all kind of began in 2008 when the NIH started the Human Microbiome Project to really characterize all of the organisms that are living with us and on us and in us um, using uh, new DNA technology. The main sites that they're looking at um, are listed on the slide and the gut in IBD, inflammatory bowel disease, is led by a brilliant gastroenterologist at Mass General again, Romnick Xavier. Um, who was uh, this fellow when I was a fellow, and he took it to a new level, slept in a cot in the lab, and 36 hours straight, doing, uh, just incredible man, and he's really made some incredible strides in our understanding of the microbiome, inflammatory bowel disease, and genetics. There are 100 trillion bugs in each human. That is more than a 10,000 species, 1,000 species, 1,000 species in humans of uh, bacteria with 750,000 genes. That's more genes than we have. So we walk around with more bacterial DNA in us than we have human DNA. Most of these bacteria have never been isolated. They're incredibly difficult to culture. We can't culture them. And so the way we know about them now is through sequencing. And these new genetics allow us insight into understanding the, uh, the, the whole biome that lives within us. One of the findings is a whole new kingdom called archaea. Archaea are um, uh, microbes that live in us that are not eukaryotes, they're not bacteria, a whole new kingdom uh, initially classified as a bacteria. Um, fascinating, we don't really know what their role is in human health and, and and now we're learning about uh, bacteriophages, viruses that infect many of the bacteria in our gut. And so there's so much more we have to learn about and how it relates to us. And there are some really interesting studies that I'm going to be sharing with you in a moment. The whole um, basis of this understanding is on PCR, polymerase chain reaction. And, and starting in 2000, 2002, 2003, people started using PCR to understand our environment better. You may have heard about this uh, adventurer scientist, Craig Ventner, who went around the ocean sampling water and running PCR on it, and he identified all sorts of things that we didn't know about living in our oceans, bacteria, new species, it's really incredible stuff. It's opened up the window. Here's how we um, do sequencing. If you're sequencing the environment, I don't, this slide doesn't communicate so well, so we have uh, different environments, you sample the environment, you filter them, you create, uh, you isolate their DNA here. I think this, I, yeah, isolate the DNA, uh, you run them through sequencing, you create um, uh, clones, and this is the magic machine. It costs about $600,000. It is the Illumina HiSeq. Um, there's a uh, machine, the latest version, the HiSeq Illumina. Um, can do the whole entire human genome in just six days. 
and it's incredibly automated and it's becoming more and more readily available. In fact, Children's is looking to buy their first high seek. There's already uh, uh, machines at Georgia Tech and, and Emory. Um, and it generates huge amounts of data, uh, a terabyte of data in six days. And that's part of the problem with any of the sequencing is there's tremendous amounts of data. So it's creating a whole new uh, science of how do we handle this mega data and how we understand it and look for trends and significant uh, findings. I uh, ran through the gluten to kind of talk to you about this, but the flora seems to be different where you look in the GI tract. If you look in the mouth or the esophagus or the stomach, the small intestine, the colon, the floor is different all the way through. And this bacteria, this is incredible. It interacts with us in different ways. Do you guys already know all about this? And am I giving you somewhat new stuff here? OK. We want to know everything. OK, great. <laughs> let's, let's go out to dinner and we'll talk. Um, <laughs> So th what, what's really incredible is without knowing it, you guys are having strong influence on your patient's microbiome. Uh, here's an interesting study. Um, depending on how the infant was delivered, if there's no family history, no maternal history of allergy, and it's a vaginal delivery, the adjusted odds ratio of having egg allergy at one to two years of age is even. If you do have a maternal allergy, but you're still born vaginally, um, you have a two and a half fold increase in your uh, odds ratio. But if you're a C-section with the same maternal history of allergy, the incidence of the egg allergy at age one to two goes up dramatically. And why is that? That is because um, there is a stepwise colonization of uh, our microbiome and it starts actually in utero. We used to think the uterus was sterile, but we have found traces of lactobacilli and bifidobacteria in the placenta, in the meconium, and in the cord blood of healthy neonates. And again, that's through the power of genetics that we're able to find that. We can't grow it out of the uterus, but we can find their DNA remnants. At birth, it depends on if you're delivered vaginally or by C-section, what type of bacteria you start to populate your gut with. Lactobacilli, Prevotella, uh, for vaginally delivered C-section, staph, strep, chorani, the things on our skin. Later on in infancy, breastfed infants have higher levels of bifido. Formula-fed infants more commonly colonize with non-bifido bacteria, and they have more C. diff and more E. coli. So through our life, we have a progression of how, uh, I give credit to Ben Gold, I stole this slide from him completely, progression of microbiota from newborn to adulthood. And the interesting thing is the first three years are the most influential. This is when you have the most changes in our microbial instability, changes that are influenced by our diet. Uh, you can see differences in microbial uh, diversity depending on where you grow up in the world based on what your regional diet is. Illnesses, what antibiotics you've been exposed to, probably what viruses you've been exposed to, what bacteriophages you've been exposed to. So those first three years, you guys are changing your patient's microbiome through the use of antibiotics, but also through the use of PPIs. Uh, proton pump inhibitors also appear to change our microbiome some. In adulthood, it is a little bit different of a microbiome than infants in early childhood. It is a more stable environment. It's slower to change, but it does change over time. These are three words that you're going to hear about when people talk about the microbiome and disease, and it's richness, diversity, and dysbiosis. I'm going to focus on dysbiosis right here. Um, and we don't really know what comes first, the chicken-egg phenomenon with dysbiosis. Um, is the dysbiosis the cause of the disease, or does the disease cause a dysbiosis? That hasn't fully been elucidated yet. But many disorders have been shown, ranging from obesity, inflammatory bowel disease. Many disorders have a dysbiosis. And what that means is that somebody took a stool sample from somebody with the disease and compared it to somebody without, and they found differences in healthy bacteria in those people with the disease. But temporally, it's not clear yet which, uh, which comes first, the dysbiosis or the disease. Functionality is really fascinating to me. That's really um, kind of the super exciting thing. And um, here's an example, this xyloglucan. Uh, all right, Dr. Kleiman, what foods have xyloglucans in them? 
That's lettuce. It's a cell wall polysaccharide in lettuce and onions, okay? We don't digest it. We can't digest this. But guess what? We have bacteria that live in us that digest it. In fact, this is a well-conserved bacteria, so 90% of us have bacteria that digest xyloglucans for us. Um, fiber. Fiber is digested by our colonic bacteria, makes short-chain fatty acids. Some of those short-chain fatty acids can be carcinogenic. Some of them modulate immune function. Some of them might make us feel tired after we eat a big lunch. It might be the bacteria byproducts of what we're eating that make us feel a certain way. Um, but it's very clear that there's an interaction between the gut bacteria and our immune system in terms of tolerance to allergens, colitis, tumor genesis, things like that. This experiment this is fascinating to me. They took this um, mouse. It's a conventionally raised mouse with regular bacteria in its gut. And bac mice eat their coprophagic, so they eat stool. Um, so it's not such a bad thing to put mouse poop into another mouse. But they uh, took a nobo notobiotic, is that the way you say it? Notobiotic mouse, germ-free mouse. So they raise these mice in germ-free environments, and after several generations, the mice don't have a lot of bacteria in them. They probably do have some if you look through PCR. But germ-free mouse, and you took it, and uh, they have normal weight gain. Um, on, on the exact same diet, if you took the stool from a, a genetically fat mouse and you put it in this notobiotic mouse, the mouse becomes fat. This is actually 10 years now. Now it's been repeated with uh, human stool. So they took these, uh, these identical twins. Uh, one is the uh, uh, left-facing and one is the right-facing isomer. But they happen to, for some reason, be buying the same clothes. But one is heavy and one is thin. And they took the stool from the thin human twin and put it in the notobiotic mouse. And the mouse stayed lean on the exact same diet, They're on the exact same diet. But the, the stool from the overweight twin into the same mouse, germ-free mouse populated, and the mouse became obese. To me, that's like, wow. Are the metabolites of what we're eating driving our insulin sensitivity, driving our appetite? Are they creating hunger through the bacteria digestion of, of what we're eating? And maybe the reason that we see fat families is in part not just because they're all eating chips and they, they're sedentary. I'm sure that's part of it. But maybe part of it is also that their microbiome is telling them signals to uh, eat a lot or, or to consume a lot or maybe making byproducts that make us overweight. So the last chapter I probably have three minutes on. This is the ultimate probiotic. I really didn't cover probiotics. We can talk about that in the Q&A. Is fecal transplants is dear, near and dear to my heart. But once again, Mass General took the lead, right? George Russell um, was one of the first to report uh, pediatric fecal transplants. Um, so fecal transplant sounds disgusting, but it is the ultimate probiotic. And we're using it in C. diff. C. diff is a spore-forming gram-positive bacilli. You all know about it after they've been on antibiotics. Uh, that's the greatest risk factor, but we're also seeing C. diff in the community when you have not been exposed to antibiotics. C. diff is a big problem. We're seeing more and more C. diff. Granted, this is more the elderly, the nursing homes, hospitalized patients. It's not as big a pediatric problem, but it is a big problem. It is hard to treat. 14,000 people die of C. diff a year. And we're starting to see some resistance to flagell and vancomycin, although that's unusual. Here's the, bugger, the, the, the bugaboo, the problem with C. diff is that it uh, recurs. So you, you treat the initial infection up to 20% of the time after 10 days of antibiotics, the patient will get sick again. I don't think we see that this high a frequency in kids, but we do see recurrence. The recurrence usually starts within a few weeks of finishing the antibiotics. Remember, the antibiotics are killing not just the C. diff, they're also killing all the healthy bacteria too. So we we go as next step, long pulses of vancomycin. The schedule that I use is uh, three times a day for a couple weeks, then twice a day for a week, then every day for a week. But still, some kids still have um, ongoing, uh, ongoing symptoms despite the long vancomycin course. And so FMT comes along. And if you replace the gut microbiota with the flora from a healthy individual, 
you, all, you can magically cure recurring refractory C. diff. And it, it happens within 24 to 48 hours, and it's, the effective rate is over 90%. Donor screening is a big deal. You don't want to give them other problems, and so we don't take stool from people with obesity or irritable bowel syndrome, um, metabolic syndrome. We don't know what the role of the microbiome is in these disorders, so we try to avoid them. Um, and then you give the, um, the, the stool by either NG, NJ, colonoscopy, or now frozen capsules, uh, MGH again, leader. Um, gosh, that sounds like I should get a job at MGH. Um, I had one at one time, but um, they uh, concentrated the bacteria, um, got it into little capsules, and if you take 15 of those frozen capsules two days in a row, it is 90 plus percent effective in getting rid of uh, C. diff. FMT, we consult, we educate the family about what we're doing, we tell them that we don't know that there could be down, uh, uh, there could be risks in the long term. Um, I've only done it by NJ or colonoscopy. In the future, we will use the frozen pills. We infuse the filtered, frozen, thawed stool directly into the intestine. Uh, we watch them for allergic reactions. Um, and uh, most of the stool samples that I've done have come from a stool donor bank. My son, a 16-year-old enterprising son, wants to be a donor. When I told him they give $30 per donation, he's like, sign me up. I think that's his, uh, his uh, I'm hoping that's not his entire uh, future, but I guess there could be worse things than curing C. diff, right? Um, so again, this uh, donor stool bank uses very strict donor screening, and I, I've been surprised that most parents are very accepting of using a donor bank instead of screening themselves or um, a neighbor or a friend or relative. Almost done. Um, we've done 20 patients in the past year. The first was in July 2014. I've done them as young as age two. We have had some kids with abdominal distension, some fever, diarrhea. We had severe diarrhea in two patients. One of them had a colostomy, uh, a colectomy, and he had an ileostomy. It probably didn't take, um, but that, that was a legitimate adverse event. But 18 out of the 20 patients had really significant clinical improvement. And we are studying this, and I'll show you my last slide. This is kind of cool. So this is a diversity plot. Um, and this first column is the donor. So a lot of the green bacteria, this Bacteroides, um, some of the yellow bacteria, it doesn't show up very good here. Here is the recipient. So a very different profile when you just compare the colors. And then six months later, this is the recipient, looks much closer to the donor. And this process is repeated again and again. So this is really cool, changing somebody's microbiome. We're playing a little bit with fire, maybe. We don't know what bacteriophages or what pre are we transferring something that might induce Alzheimer's in their 60s? We don't know. But we are curing their C. diff, and we are changing their microbiome with this. And this is something that there's a ton of study on, much better places to study than, than, than my practice. But, but we're trying to make a contribution, too. And with that, I will conclude uh, lessons learned, safe and effective. We can do it. Don't do it in ileostomy patients, probably. And that there is growing interest in FMT for other conditions. Thank you. I had a quick question. Sylvia Washington from Rome, Georgia. Um, for kids with chronic GI symptoms, um, do you recommend panel testing versus individual testing, like TTG, um, um, IgA versus like a panel of testing? There are companies, you know, that manufacture those panels and push for them. They change the panels around, and, and it's confusing for me. So I just remember the TTG and the IgA over the age of three. Um, the panel is, it, it's supposed to save money. For example, if your TTG is positive, you don't need to do the IgA. Um, but many of the panels don't include the gliadin. So if you're just sorting a celiac panel in an 18-month-old with a bloated belly and diarrhea, you're, it's going to come back maybe negative, and the kid could still have celiac as marked by gliadin antibodies. So I, I like, panels are very helpful when you, you're a busy practice and it's easy to click or just to order, but Celiac, I think if you can remember the TTG and the IgA, you'll be safe, and then under the age of three. <laughs>